afternoon, everyone. We are going to, uh, to talk today about the mega infrastructure projects that are ongoing in the GCC and the MENA region. Um, for that, uh, I will be here with, with valuable uh, panelists and uh, the intervention of uh, uh, His Excellency Kamal bin Ahmed Mohammed, Minister of Transportation and Telecommunication of Bahrain. Uh, His Excellency, beside being uh, a minister, he is a, an engineer, civil engineer, who holds a master in project management from Leeds University. Uh, he's also uh, the Economic Development Board uh, Chief Executive, <coughs> the Vice Chairman of Bahrain uh, uh, Mumtalakat, and uh, heading the Higher Education Council and many others. Your Excellency, you are more than welcome. And uh, if you can give us uh, an opening note. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been asked to give an opening remark to stimulate the discussion of our wonderful panelists. Uh, we all agree that infrastructure is fundamental to enable economic and social development. All nations are investing in their infrastructure to enhance their competitiveness, to attract foreign direct investment, to stimulate their private sector, to, to create new jobs uh, in their countries. Uh, and the infrastructure, of course, vary from one <coughs> part in the Arab world to the other part. Uh, I can talk here a little bit about the GCC countries, and uh, I think the GCC country has utilized efficiently uh, the revenue they generated from the oil uh, over the past uh, three to four decades uh, to build what we can see today, the state-of-the-art infrastructure, uh, the physical basic infrastructure that uh, enable us today to enhance our competitiveness. We see it in the ports, in the airports, highways, uh, electricity and water generation, uh, etc. Uh, so it's it's uh, I can say it's an advanced stage in the in the GCC countries. Maybe it needs to be developed more in the other part of the Arab world. Uh, and therefore, of course, we will continue investing and expanding our uh, our basic infrastructure because simply we are growing. We need to have additional power generation. We need more highways. We need more expanding our airports. We are building in Bahrain new terminal. But uh, I think currently the GCC countries, I can say most of them are focusing not in the physical infrastructure, but they are focusing in the digital infrastructure, uh, simply because we want to make sure that we maximize the benefits and we capture the benefit of the fourth industrial revolution and the digital transformation that's happening uh, currently. Uh, so in Bahrain, for example, we uh, spent the last four years uh, making sure that we have the right national broadband network in our countries. And we aim by end of 2019 90% uh, of Bahrain will be covered by a uh, high-speed uh, fiber optic uh, mm. network. Uh, <coughs> we hopefully, inshallah, by uh, mid of June or end of June, we will be the, among the first country in the world to offer uh, commercial uh, 5G uh, services. Uh, again, we are working with international organizations to attract them to our countries to uh, provide us with the digital infrastructure, the smart infrastructure, and we are happy to have Amazon Web Services uh, opening their first uh, hyperscale uh, data center in our countries. And this is the focus nowadays in the, Arab, uh, in, in the GC countries, not only to expand our physical infrastructure, but to focus more in, in the digital smart uh, infrastructure to enable us to maximize the benefit, to create the quality jobs, uh, to really uh, realize the digital economy and the knowledge-based economy. Uh, of course, uh, infrastructure is one part of it. We need to invest also in create the ecosystem and our human resources, human capital, uh, our regulation, uh, uh, creating the ecosystem, access to fund, access to... Uh, we, are, we have a number of several accelerator and uh, incubator, and we consider them infrastructure because they are the institution required to develop the ecosystem, the digital ecosystem. So the infrastructure are different today than what used to be in the past. So in the past it is mega projects only, like airports and ports, but today I think the infrastructure is more of institution and facility that you need to have, or infrastructure like the fiber optic, the 5G network, that a lot of people may be telling us, why you need it today? There is no customer for it, but we know that it's coming. Uh, having it today, especially in a country like Bahrain, which is, can be done easily, uh, we are a small island, so we can uh, afford to do it. Uh, and we are encouraging, as a policymaker, uh, the operators in Bahrain to develop this infrastructure by uh, incentivizing with the, with the, with the, our regulatory, let's say, uh, 
uh, ability to incentivize them to, to invest in Bahrain and expand the, uh, the network. Uh, during the last five years, $700 million has been spent to enhance the telecom infrastructure in Bahrain, which is the backbone for the digital economy. So I think, uh, as I said, uh, it's different from one part of the Arab world to the other part of the, uh, of the Arab world. In the GCC, uh, the physical infrastructure is well developed. Uh, we will expand it because we are growing and we need to grow it. Uh, but I think the focus now in digital infrastructure, uh, making sure that we uh, make our countries uh, the hub to test and uh, develop the next generation service and product. Uh, this is why today you, you may see my colleagues from the ADBs talking about startup, talking about the FinTech uh, incubator that we have created in Bahrain, because we want to make Bahrain a leading innovation enabler, uh, the best place in the region to as I said, attract those who has the new ideas that will create the future product and services. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, in fact, uh, you insisted on the digital uh, infrastructure, which is essential, especially <coughs> that uh, Bahrain is known for being uh, the banking sector hub uh, for this region. So obviously, it is clearly uh, uh, um, uh, mandatory to have a, a, a digital infrastructure. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, let me uh, uh, continue uh, with, our, with our debate by presenting uh, Stephanie uh, von Friedberg, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the IFC, universally known. Uh, in addition to, uh, to you uh, seeing uh, the business uh, uh, development of the IFC, uh, you are delivering capital to create jobs and positive development outcomes for the most needy population in the world. You manage 55 billion US dollar debt and portfolio across more than 100 offices uh, uh, around the world. And you started your career in the, in the World Bank, as I understood. And uh, you, uh, you specialized at one point of time in Africa and uh, uh, Western Europe, namely Russia in the post-Soviet uh, Union uh, era. So welcome and uh, we are glad to have you with us and let's start the, the, the debate. Uh, today we are, we are seeing uh, 2.4 trillion uh, euros uh, or dollars budget in the GCC countries. Basically we're talking about infrastructure, railroads, roads, we're talking about NEOM, we're talking about many mega infrastructure projects ongoing in the GCC and even beyond in the MENA region, where I believe you are operating. Uh, how do you see these infrastructures? Uh, <coughs> and how do you see it accelerating, if possible, uh, being more feasible, uh, being more uh, to the ground? How do you uh, visualize the future of these projects? And how can the financing be part of this adventure? So first, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, we actually see infrastructure as a core pillar to what we do. So it is a key piece of our strategy. We actually don't invest in the GCC, but we invest more broadly in the, the MENA region. And we believe that infrastructure increases competitiveness and it creates long-term economic growth. And mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, the World Bank did a study very recently and jobs are important for the MENA region. For every $100 million of investment you have in infrastructure, you create somewhere in the range of 50,000 jobs directly and indirectly. Mm -hmm. So in addition to providing the core infrastructure you need to run your economy, you're also creating jobs and, and growth from that. Um, we also think that there's about $100 billion of need in infrastructure in the MENA region year on year just to keep pace with growth. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities for infrastructure is, are huge. Um, in the countries in which we work, the governments lack fiscal space to continue to make those core infrastructure investments, roads, water, airports, ports. Mm -hmm. uh, and our view is the only way that will happen is to crowd in new sources of finance. So patient capital that's been sitting on the sidelines that can actually come into some of these larger infrastructure investments that can be done by the private sector. So we focus primarily on private sector infrastructure development through public-private partnerships, through private companies who are looking to invest. We have very big pipelines in Iraq, in, in Jordan, um, in Egypt. So we see opportunities um, in the MENA region to be very good and, and very strong. Great. In fact, uh, um, I will turn to, uh, to Mary, uh, uh, who is uh, joining us. Uh, Mary Nazel Batayne. Uh, you're, um, I saw your, your 
profile yesterday. Uh, I, I browsed a little bit and I was impressed, I have to say, with, the, with what I saw. You're a barrister, you're a founder and chairperson for Landmark Hotel and founder of 17 Asset Management. You're also an activist, you're a, a young uh, global leader. Uh, you're holding a BA in political science from uh, Barnard College in Colombia, but uh, other law degrees as well. And you've been chosen by Forbes as one of the most powerful Arab women for many consecutive years. That's an impressive uh, CV. We are happy to have you with us here uh, today. Uh, before the session, uh, you, uh, you mentioned that, that you wanted to insist on the, the, the private funding brought to infrastructure projects, not only in the GCC, but in the, in the MENA region, which is uh, pretty well uh, echoing with uh, what, uh, what Stephanie just said. Uh, what is your vision? How do you see it accelerating the infrastructure projects in our region? Hmm. Well, I think there are various new finance products that we can be using to accelerate um, infrastructure like blended finance and that's something that I would like to talk about more extensively and it's something that my company 17 asset management is really um, focused on especially for Jordan and the neighboring countries but just to step back I think it's really important to see infrastructure as an opportunity to accelerate the positive social impact um, that we can have on people so how can we use this deployment this huge deployment of capital uh, into infrastructure to have this positive impact on health and education and women and youth and refugees. This is a huge issue. And the good news is that the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations provides us with a great development framework as to how we can use infrastructure um, to help advance the SDGs. So we have SDGs directly related to infrastructure. But the, the incredible thing is that there's Im implicitly, you can use, use infrastructure to impact other SDGs like poverty, the environment, SDG 5 on gender equality. And the other very interesting um, part of using the SDGs as a framework when we talk about infrastructure is we can look at impact measurement. I mean, how do we really know that the infrastructure projects that we're doing are having that really important positive social impact mm -hmm. on people and the environment. The SDGs allows us to do that. And I think if we take this um, way of thinking, you know, looking at the problem, what are the problems that people are facing? You know, like women going to work in Jordan, which warrants a transportation system. If we start looking at what are the challenges that people are facing, what are the challenges that we're facing when it comes to the environment, and then you know, establish that empathy and start co-creating those infrastructure projects from the ground up, you're more likely to have a positive impact, and you're more likely to have the stability that we're looking for in the region. And I think only if you take that way of looking at it will you have um, that stability. And 17 Asset Management is coming in um, to advance this way of thinking. That's why we've created our company, to try and drive capital towards the Sustainable Development Goals, capital that's previously been untapped. Great. Uh, that, uh, that leads us to, uh, um, uh, to Thierry Do, uh, and uh, also uh, is uh, is a, is a captain of, uh, of industry in, uh, in financing. Uh, Thierry, I, I, was, uh, I saw your, uh, uh, your, your, your background and you, you were leading uh, many uh, institutions in France. Uh, you are also uh, an engineer uh, from a reputable uh, uh, university in, in France, Ponts et Chaussées. Uh, and you, you are running uh, now Meridian. And you're going to tell us about, uh, about this, uh, this company or sharing it. But before that, um, we are talking here about financing of infrastructure projects. And before the session, <coughs> we spoke about the fact that GCC countries might not be the first ones to be interested into uh, foreign investments, uh, especially for infrastructure. Uh, you are investing in other parts of the Arab world. Tell us more about your priorities 
How do you see uh, uh, investment, namely from the private sector, into infrastructure? And is it extendable to other uh, uh, domains than roads, rail, uh, railroads, etc.? <coughs> Thank you. Um, first, I'll vote for Mary because uh, <laughs> uh, after uh, 15 years of doing uh, sustainable infrastructure as a policy and a, and a scope for our funds, uh, we've actually adopted two years ago an SDG-driven uh, sustainability policy and that allows us to focus our investment on the highest impact, but also able to report and measure uh, impact because I think part of the difficulty uh, because of the SDGs were initially uh, set up for government to sort of define their policies. But as the industry is adapting it, it's making it a bit more practical and concrete in terms of implementation, measurement, uh, and, and so one can be credible in measuring, but it does require a good methodology and data gathering and, and reliability of data. But the reason I mentioned it is because it drives where we invest and it also drives the way uh, we, we invest. So we, <coughs> we, we, we do invest in, in a number of countries of the Arab world. I mean, obviously, most of the African part, but, but as well in Jordan and all the way up to, to, to Turkey and, and, and Egypt. And what we focus on is what we think the government should be focusing on, <laughs> which is the priorities in terms of where impact needs to be uh, created. So then it will vary very much depending on government's priority. I mean, obviously, if you think about Jordan uh, and, and the issues with refugees and sort of permanent refugees and the, the necessity to uh, cater a population for basic services, um, I guess we're less talking about mega digital infrastructure that we are talking about basic needs. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, this is for the Jordan people to decide what their priorities are. But we, we try also, and this is something that we've been doing in Jordan, and this is SDG 17, to partner mm -hmm. uh, with IFIs in particular uh, to provide support. Because I think uh, one of the big obstacle to infrastructure proper investment, uh, whether you want to invite private sector or not, but to select the right one and to design it the way it should be and to address impact and social needs is that there's a lack of capacity generally uh, because there's a lack of shared experience. And I think uh, uh, a number of the IFRs and IFC has actually sort of pivoted a few years ago into supporting early stage thinking and development of project, but this is fundamental to actually achieve the right impact, but also to mm -hmm. unlock the investment because a lot of them are sort of stuck in mm -hmm. bureaucratic processes and, and somehow lack of experience often, but this is rather global, not, not only in the MENA, mm -hmm. <laughs> MENA region. Uh, and so that, that's a, a very important part of what we do. We do work a lot upstream with government uh, and in this particular region where we have uh, a partnership with the EBRD, we try to, to support and bring ideas and other ways. Uh, we also that extend to the blended finance that you were mentioning. Um, uh, years ago in Turkey, we were able to bring uh, with EBRD and IFC was actually uh, part of that with the uh, MIGA as, as part of the uh, World Bank Group. Um, <clears throat> able to issue a bond in Turkey for a hospital uh, in Elazig that actually allowed us to achieve a rating that is still now probably about three or four notches above sovereign rating in Turkey, but allowed uh, investors from uh, international investors to actually feel comfortable in investing there. So it, it's all about bringing and partnering uh, between government, the IFIs have a fundamental role, and to me, they should be the sort of new leaders of how to create impact through their power of patient capital, their power of uh, concessional capital, but also their power of structuring and advisory to bring all, uh, all of us together. Um, but on the other end, uh, as sort of private sector investor, we, we manage today about 7 billion euros from institution around the world, uh, and they invest for very long term with us, the 25 years funds that we, we have, they also need to see this impact. They also need to take 
responsibility for whatever we're creating. And, and that sort of virtuous circle of partnership can actually uh, allow these countries when focusing on the right things. Because I, as much as I'm an engineer and I like to build big things, uh, <laughs> I also know that it's usually not a good idea. You have to think about it twice before you invest a lot of capital into a big infrastructure without thinking about the impact. Great, and, uh, and we will come back to, to the driver of these investors that are willing to, to come in, in, in the region mm. and their driver beside SDG, uh, uh, the green impact of, of or not of these infrastructure. We'll come to, to that point, but before that I will, uh, I will welcome uh, Bishoya Azmi who is uh, on the execution side of, of, of uh, once these funds are found. Uh, he's the chief executive officer of uh, ASGC which is a, a group in the United Emirates, a construction leader. Uh, you're an ACUN, as we say in, uh, in Egypt. You, you, are, you are graduated from the AUC and you're hold, holding a Master of Science in International Construction Management, which says it all about uh, project management in, uh, in construction. You're leading on a multinational contractor employing uh, 1,600 people people and generating nearly one billion US dollar in revenue. Uh, welcome uh, Bishoy. My, my, uh, my question to you about after we heard uh, uh, what, what drive the investment willingness of, the, uh, of the, the, the investors, my question to you is how do you see these infrastructure projects ongoing currently in the MENA region and in particular in the GCC, how do you, do you see them transforming? How can we accelerate them, namely in execution, from financing point of view, but also from execution point of view? How can we accelerate the execution yes. of infrastructure projects? Okay. Well, actually in the GCC, construction is pretty fast. Uh, so um, the GCC is a fairly advanced uh, group of countries in terms of basic infrastructure. Uh, funding is available. Uh, government has recognized a few decades ago that uh, basic infrastructure is a good idea and they've spent on it generously. So where I come from, Dubai, for example, is a very advanced city in terms of, you know, hardcore infrastructure. Um, and the speed of construction and the speed of delivery and the speed of arranging funding um, uh, for these hard infrastructure facilities is honestly already sort of uh, pretty advanced even in comparison to the most advanced uh, uh, developed countries around the world. Um, I'd like to say that because we're talking about MENA, so um, we have sort of a tale of two cities, if you like, where uh, some countries already have a very advanced hard infrastructure um, and have the funding available, <coughs> and some countries do not. And as we can see uh, uh, from entities uh, such as IFC with Stephanie or even uh, private financing arrangers uh, like Meridium and TRE, that uh, the funding dynamics for the GCC are different than the funding dynamics for uh, other countries in the Levant and North Africa, which are also part of, of MENA. Uh, and I think that there's availability of funding for both. Uh, but I think the question now is, how can we efficiently use the dollars available, whether it's government money in GCC or funding through <coughs> international agencies or uh, um, finance providers or export credit agencies or private sector in North Africa and Levant, how can you use this dollar spend in the most efficient way? Mm -hmm. so, so you see in your, in your field the technology uh, uh, becoming more influential in the, in the way you use these, uh, these fundings, uh, software, digitization in your world? Totally. So um, the dollar spent on, on soft infrastructure goes a lot uh, more than a dollar spend on hard infrastructure. Um, um, and sometimes we actually overspend on, on hard infrastructure uh, when you know, the country doesn't need yet one more glamorous X, Y, or Z, but it needs enablers, uh, it, it needs uh, young people to be incentivized, it needs a paradigm, uh, an environment and a framework. So we're too hard on infrastructure mm -hmm. as ports and harbors and airports and you know, roads and shopping malls. Um, but um, it's all now about creating that environment for 
I mean, we, we have a region with the highest percentage of young people in the world, right? So we need to see how we focus as policymakers or as governments or as investors, uh, uh, you know, our efforts in that direction. So how can we support the young uh, and how can we um, actually develop the country? It's probably through soft infrastructure. So through connectivity, uh, through laws, through uh, uh, frameworks and incentives. Yeah. Quite, uh, quite interesting knowing that uh, uh, we see now uh, the digital world coming in uh, uh, quite heavily in the world of construction, which is not obvious at the first sight, but is now becoming uh, uh, quite impressive with BIM concept, uh, B BIL concepts in your construction field. Uh, and knowing that 10% of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the projects are wasted uh, today uh, in, in material, so the optimization and efficiency can be obviously a, a solution. Uh, for sure, and I would even argue that probably more than 10% of material is wasted through also inefficient designs. So if you look at how much money is spent on infrastructure, mm -hmm. and you say, if we can more intelligently forget my first point about what we built, but if I go mm -hmm. now to your point as how we built it, so if we say, let us uh, design it more intelligently, let us manage the entire process from the moment we arrange finance and its life cycle cost. How do we run this airport? Mm -hmm. How do we run this hospital? We can save not 10%, 20, 30, 40%. It's really <coughs> ridiculous how much inefficiency there is in hard infrastructure. And this money can then be plowed back into more infrastructure, right? So the issue is not the funding. The issue is the efficiency across the value chain. Yeah. Great, yeah. which is, by the way, uh, uh, interesting for uh, the fundraisers yeah. uh, to be uh, to be confident in the project execution and its uh, efficiency. Yeah. I come back to, to this question related to the interest of the financiers and uh, the investors yeah. uh, in the MENA region. Uh, Stephanie, what is the IFC looking at beside the traditional uh, SDGs uh, uh, that uh, that we can we all know? What are you looking at in a project, in its feasibility, mm -hmm. uh, if we speak about its green CO2 impact? Are there other concepts that you look at before financing a project? There's been so many great things said. We could take this conversation in many different directions. But let me start by saying that I think of IFC as the mother of all impact investors. Mm. So we've been at this for 60 plus years we breathe and live impact. And impact mm. means meeting the SDGs, it means doing the right thing for the environment, it means ensuring that you have the right social compact, it means ensuring that you have the right governance inside of an organization into which you're investing. So we look very holistically at that. And as a matter of fact, this week, this coming week is our spring meetings, and I would invite you guys to be participants. We're actually launching we what we call the impact <laughs> principles. And they're really about saying, invest with intent around impact, around environmental and social and governance. Say what you're going to measure, measure it and use an independent third party to validate what you're doing. So impact is something that we live and breathe in every one of our projects, not just in infrastructure. Um, and what I actually think we need to focus on in MENA maybe goes a little bit beyond that. And it goes back to something you were saying, Terry. So between 1993 and 2013, <coughs> There were only 151 private infrastructure projects built mm -hmm. in MENA. Mm -hmm. Between 1990 and 2018, $59 billion in MENA. That's less than any other region in the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we need to focus on and where we are focusing is how do we actually create the environment, the policy, and regulatory regimes and the ability for private sector infrastructure projects to happen and then help bank them. And again, using impact and using our development tools so that we're actually doing the right thing for the environment and for society as we're developing those. I think it's critical. And I would include amongst that digital infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So Terry, you said basic mm -hmm. infrastructure, roads, water. When I look at MENA in particular and you talk about the development of the fourth industrial revolution and the ability to employ the youth, People talk about doing it via new technologies. Mm -hmm. That will not happen unless we connect every single person in the world to the internet. And while it's not an, a, a, a MENA statistic, there are about 60% of the people in Africa who live dark. They are not connected to the internet. And yet we want to give them 5G, that's not gonna happen. Uh, you know, in the, in the 
countries in which we invest in MENA, there isn't 5G. There's not access to 4G. It's mainly 2 and 3G. And mm -hmm. I was actually in Lebanon a couple of weeks ago talking to a, a, a bunch of guys that have an incubator. And I said, well, where are you storing your data? We use AWS and Rackspace in London and in Europe. So no, it's good that mm -hmm. we now have one in Bahrain. But no big data centers in, in the Middle East. So to think about digital infrastructure as being a luxury and being bifurcated from the other core infrastructure, I think may actually be a mistake for the region. Great, so that's, that's an important insight. So digital infrastructure is considered as a basic need nowadays. I consider it a basic need. I consider it no different from water and power. So affordable, reliable access to the internet is critical to the future. That sounds great for a technology company like mine, Schneider Electric, we are specialized in that. So good news for us. Mary, what would you like to say about what had just been uh, commented by Stephanie? Digital well, infrastructure. I mean, you're the guru here, so I'm not going to disagree with anything that uh, you say. But I think um, digital infrastructure is really important when it comes to getting women into the economy. Absolutely. So in Jordan, um, where I'm very active in terms of trying to encourage women to join the workforce in hospitality and other areas, um, women's economic participation rate is about 14%. So if you really create that digital infrastructure, you uh, create new jobs where women can be working from home. There are some amazing local startups like Crystal Call that has set up back office services um, in uh, the north of Jordan. And uh, the government and His Majesty are really keen on making Jordan sort of this back office support and also a center for RNZ. So I think that uh, digital infrastructure is key. Um, coming back more broadly to financing. Mm -hmm. I think Jordan has some great examples on successful PPP uh, projects. Obviously, the airport and the Al Samra wastewater plant has been a very successful example, and they're also looking to expand and looking to attract uh, additional capital for that. Um, but I think just to speak a bit about blended financing, uh, if I may, I think really this is a way for Jordan and, and Palestine as well to be attracting uh, private capital. Because essentially what blended financing does is use public capital, concessionary capital like donor funding or IFI funding or whatever, to catalyze private investment, therefore de-risking. So as 17 Asset Management, we're using blended finance as a key tool to attract private investment into Jordan, the right kind of socially responsible private investment. And there are increasingly more and more institutional investors and um, backing the SDGs and looking for investments that have a return, uh, but also have a social return. Mm -hmm. So our first product as 17 Asset Management uh, is something we've called the SDG Jordan Growth Fund, um, where we're looking to hit investments that um, also impact SDG 5, gender equality, because that's a huge opportunity. Like, I see the gender gap in Jordan as a huge opportunity for growth. You have 14% of women in the workforce, but you have over 50% of women who are highly educated. How can we provide these women with SDG 8, decent work and economic growth? So our investments through the SDG Growth Fund will be going to companies that have a positive impact on gender, and also SDG 8, which is decent work and economic growth. So I think using blended finance is also important because you take that public good that donors and IFIs have committed to, like you said, for so many years, and you take the commercial interest that the private sector has and you bring it together. And I think for infrastructure in particular, that's the kind of capital you need. You need socially responsible capital that is sustainable and is looking for a broader purpose. But but do you really find private equity mm -hmm. investors who are really interested in SDGs? Absolutely, from absolutely. Um, you have institutional investors like pension funds, insurance money, high net worth, family offices. You have millennials that are really interested in where their money is going. So I support a social enterprise in the poorest camp in Jordan, which is called SEP. And SEP has been successful. We make luxury accessories for the global markets. Mm -hmm. And it's a social impact company that's serving the poorest refugees in Jordan. And millennials and other consumers are interested in SEP and looking to buy SEP products 
because they know that it has, that it's having a positive impact on people who need it the most. So certainly, there's an increasing chunk of people that are looking for a positive social return on their money. But in addition to that, by using blended finance, you're de-risking that investment for people who really just want to profit. So for the SDG Growth Fund for Jordan, the first 20% is a first loss commitment. So that means that safety net is there for the investor anyway. So for an emerging market like Jordan, you need to be de-risking investment. You need to for the meantime. And slowly that balance will shift from public capital dependency to one that has um, more private capital coming in. And that's our intention, to start telling the Jordan growth story to the world using the SDG Growth Fund, and then start attracting new private capital. Good. Thierry? I think one thing I want to, you shouldn't associate SDG with just social. Uh, it's a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, SDG includes logistic chains that are efficient, includes climate change, includes clean energy provision, includes energy efficiency, includes good jobs and economic growth. Uh, so when you're building a port and a rail to export uh, to it, you, you're actually creating impact in a framework that can be measured with the SDG. So, so just to be provocative, you don't have to be a responsible good person to invest in SDGs. So that's why <laughs> the, uh, the investors are very much uh, looking at it. Uh, some of them because they are responsible and they want to create a certain type of impact. Mm -hmm. And you have people that are gender focused or economic growth focused or climate focused. Uh, but you, you can also provide with this methodology and approach and focus sustainable cash flows for these people. What they're looking for is something that's going to last and bring their money back at one certain point. Uh, and many investors can actually buy this story with, with SDGs. So you, you, <clears throat> you don't necessarily have to overemphasize the fact that you have to be responsible. I mean, the SDGs were voted by the whole UN Assembly. That means that all the countries in the world almost um, kind of agree that that's the thing to do. It's, it's the next public good. Uh, and so financing public good one way or another uh, has to become an interest for every investor around the world. And, and clearly, I mean, uh, we have a, a pool of investors that finance us around 80 around the world. They're all very diverse and some have different type of engagement in terms of their social responsibility. Some are very strong and some are sort of just indifferent. But the fact is it works for them because when they in invest in a 25 year fund uh, that can tell them this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it, uh, it's also a, a, a better deal. The, the second point that I wanted to to add to the conversation is, is not necessarily to, um, um, and, and, and SDGs are good for that actually, oppose digital to the basic service. The, the question about digital is sometimes people think of it as, as, as a goal in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you always have to ask yourself, what for and why? <laughs> and, and if you, I mean, if I take the, your point on efficiency of infrastructure, Today, we're using big data to do preventive maintenance on major infrastructure. Uh, and you can't do that unless you digitalize your infrastructure and unless you're able to accumulate a, a lot of data. I mean, there is no roads in the US where we invest where we don't use mobile phone traffic data to actually figure out what uh, patronage would be. So it, it, digital has already got into infrastructure efficiency. So if you use it for that purpose, at the same way you can use it to give access to jobs to women, uh, then there's a purpose. And, and, and where I always get a little confused is when people talk about the tech as the tech. Uh, you know, the tech is to create jobs, is to service some things or to make something efficient, but it doesn't have a purpose in itself. And that's a personal oh, that's right. angst I have with Great. it. Do, do you see it coming, the, the, uh, the SDG uh, uh, needs or mandate uh, in your projects in the, in the GCC? Do you see it raising more than, than before? So, I mean, the GCC is, as I said, is different from uh, the uh, North Africa and Levant um, in that they already have 
the hard infrastructure, their local population does not suffer as much from unemployment or you know, uh, uh, low GDP per capita. So uh, maybe we, we don't feel it as mm -hmm. starkly as other parts of the MENA or Africa and or the, the CO2 developing world. For but example, um, definitely we now have in the UAE, for example, a Minister of Climate and Environment yes. who was speaking uh, here uh, yesterday. And um, there's a recognition that the carbon footprint of this uh, massive uh, construction mm -hmm. frenzy is not the best in the world. So um, there's uh, certainly considerations to that. And uh, we have uh, local sort of regulations that are similar to uh, LEED and other environmental uh, sort of compliance standards to improve uh, environmental compliance. So certainly from a climate perspective, uh, like Thierry said, uh, it also makes sense from a business perspective that you need to be more efficient. Mm. So uh, you could be uh, you know, concerned about trees, but you could also be concerned about your financial sort of uh, position, and it makes sense from both. That's the beauty of it. So um, I think the, the key takeaway is the, the need to be uh, more efficient and intelligent. So the onus is on us or the onus is on governments or the onus is on policymakers. The, the, the money is available, the logic for sustainable development goals is there and ticks all the boxes. Uh, how we actually execute it, what we focus on, uh, 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 you know, um, will, will govern the results. Great, thank you. Maybe we can open uh, the mics for, for questions, if any. The gentleman over here. Thank you very much, Osama al Kurdi from Saudi Arabia. Um, <clears throat> listening to everybody talk, I find it extremely interesting and, and uh, educational, um, whether it may be the ecosystem, the uh, digital infrastructure or the physical infrastructure, until I start thinking about the impact of this financing on, on the financial position of these countries that are receiving financing, whether it may be budget deficit, whether it may be the country's uh, debts, whether it may be the impact on its currency. I, I worry about that all the time and I'm, you know, <coughs> especially after what happened in, in Turkey uh, in the past few months. Um, socially responsible financing is very interesting, but it still shows a debt in the, in, the, in the financials of these countries. So what we need to do, I think, is come up with a real innovative system to finance, and, and especially I was in the 5G um, session uh, yesterday and the cost involved there is way beyond any uh, 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 mm -hmm. digital infrastructure uh, in the past. <coughs> and I worry about the impact of these finances unless it's done locally, with local money, with local investors, then the impact will be so much less. It's not gonna be zero, it's gonna be a lot less mm -hmm. than comi money coming from abroad. And, and so when we talk about developing the infrastructure, I think the impact of financing, particularly foreign financing, needs to be very carefully taken into consideration. So history of Turkey doesn't, is not repeated again. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another, uh, the lady here. I think I can take a couple of questions oh. before. I think I can take it. Hello, I am Noor Kik from the <coughs> Ministry of Public Health in Lebanon, working in the National Mental Health Program. I'd like to build on a question that you asked to the speakers, which is, in terms of SDGs, what are the non-traditional SDGs that we are looking at when you speak about infrastructure? And as some of you may know, one of the SDGs, uh, three, SDG 3, is focused on health, and it includes a focus on promoting mental health and well-being. Uh, and mental health is actually a cross-cutting issue to all SDGs because it relates to, to the ability of people to achieve their potential to study, to work, to build social relationships. Mm. And uh, yet, uh, if we look at our world, we speak about increased digital connections and connectivity between people, but we also see an increase in social disconnectivity between people, disconnection. So, uh, and this is one of the key determinants of mental ill health. And actually, worldwide, the prevalence of mental ill health is one in four. And uh, it concerns every, each and every one of us because we, any of us may go through a mental health, ill health condition at any point of our life. So, my question is how 
can we integrate these considerations and ensure policy coherence to make sure that our infrastructures that we are investing so much in actually are contributing to promoting the mental health and well-being of people and not contributing, on the contrary, to uh, decreasing people's well-being. Thank you. And there was another <coughs> question there. Hi, my name is Niraj. I'm from the Crescent Group, and we build uh, energy and port infrastructure in the region for the last 50 years. Uh, uh, I think with the gap between the fiscal break-even point and the oil prices, long-term availability of capital will be an issue in the region. And, and my really question back to you was, uh, do you see uh, new sources of financing being USPP, for example? We recently tapped into it for building a port in the US, and we got 20-year financing. We haven't seen examples of that in the region. And uh, it's a group of 50 to 60 sort of players who contribute up to $100 billion or so. And I wonder if there's a model for that to, to adopt in the region. Yeah. One last question, maybe. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sami Nefeti. I am the uh, managing partner of the InvestCorp Aberdeen um, Infrastructure Fund, a newly established fund. Um, my first question is to Stephanie. So you mentioned that uh, you, you, in the MENA region, you only focus on North Africa and the Levant rather than the Gulf region. Uh, while these countries certainly, or at least most of them, don't need the funding, I think, the, I think they need a lot of assistance with regards to the delivery. Um, infrastructure projects delivered through private sector, I don't think they have mastered the art of that and the procedures and the legal frameworks uh, that, that come with that. So I think they will benefit from a lot. Um, also a comment with regards to your, uh, to your uh, intervention earlier. Uh, I think it's very important to be able to manage the debt position of uh, these countries using private finance um, to finance infrastructure. Um, and uh, I think what is important is some of the money that is uh, sitting with sovereign wealth funds uh, should make its way back probably to these countries. It is high time that instead of uh, financing uh, growth in other countries, it starts financing growth in their home, home markets. Clear. <coughs> Thank you for this question. Maybe we can group question one and three about alternative fundings uh, and the impact of, on the depth of the countries with the uh, new sources of fi financing that are experimented in other parts of the world that could be replicated. Who wants to take that? I, mean, I, I can take the defense or of Turkey to start with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I don't believe that they've gone into problems <laughs> rather than private sector went into problems for being leveraged in uh, hard currency. But the country debt itself uh, has been rather unaffected, but they do have obviously fiscal pressure for new obligations. Um, I think part of, you know, we, we, we should be careful about not mixing everything. Um, when you finance economic infrastructure with private sector, government has absolutely no debt obligation, not even any fiscal payment obligation in it. So uh, whether it comes from outside, unless they really want to take you know, contingent liabilities like guaranteeing Forex or things like that, then they, it's a rather controlled way. I mean, obviously, it is better if uh, local funding and long-term local funding funds their own infrastructure. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not available in many countries. Um, and even in a country, an OECD country like Turkey, when you have seven-year debt and you're trying to build hospital in 30-year concession contract, it's, it's rather impossible. Uh, and if the Turkish government attracted DFIs and private sector uh, investors and debt funders to, to do it, it's because they could actually make it affordable. Uh, and, and, and therefore, by creating the 15 billion portfolio of health services that they created with that, uh, I mean, it's not without problems, we shouldn't deny that, but, but the impact that they created versus the potential 
uh, uh, impact that they could have created just by doing it locally is a huge gap. So you have choices to make, uh, and, and it's not all black and white, uh, but I would definitely support more local funding in, uh, in infrastructure, but there are limitations uh, to that. I also definitely would support uh, sovereign funds stop investing in OECDs and investing in their own country, but that's not for me to say. <laughs> so ma maybe I can jump in. So let's start with local currency. Mm -hmm. Local currency financing is critical. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at our book of business in Turkey, for example, about a $7 billion portfolio, more than 70% of it was fully hedged. So mm -hmm. didn't bother us really what happened in Turkey. So in, in, in the middle income countries, there are hedge products that are available. You can protect yourself. In the more difficult markets is where actually finding the local currency to do long-term infrastructure projects is hard. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're using blended finance. So mm -hmm. again, we are a commercial investor. We do well by doing good. Um, but we are beginning to realize that there are areas where um, additional support from, from donors and from other institutions can really help us. So we actually use the IDA balance sheet. So IDA is the poorest part of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. um, and we blend uh, local currency through the IDA balance sheet so that we can bring 10, 15 year <coughs> local currency into some of these markets so that we actually don't create um, distortions as we do private sector in, uh, infrastructure projects. And if you look, for example, at our book of business in India now, where we started with masala bonds, 100% of our business in India is rupee based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you borrow money from us in India, you're not borrowing dollars or euros or anything else. So we consider local currency to be a critical piece of our business mm -hmm. and something that has to grow going forward because we, we're not going to get where we need to go mm -hmm. by putting even private sector hard currency loans into many of these markets. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of attracting um, additional patient capital, we know it can be done. So we created a product called MCP, which is um, our you know, multi-company platform. And in essence, what we did, again, using a piece of blended finance from the Swedes, pulled down the risk portfolio of our infrastructure portfolio, and we're able to say everything that we invest in using that first loss is triple B. Mm -hmm. So we have brought seven or eight very, very large insurance and pension companies with us. They invest beside us in all of our infrastructure projects. So we're able to attract the kind of capital that we need that's long-term, that's patient. And for the, um, you know, the insurance companies and for the, the pension funds, what they're saying is really interested in infrastructure, really interested in doing this in emerging markets, not capable of doing it on a deal-by-deal -deal basis to understand the risk. And by the way, we, needed a, we, you know, we need a rated instrument or we need something that we can actually rate. So MCPP is an example of where, again, using blended finance, using very small amounts of first loss, mm -hmm. you can attract a lot of additional capital. Um, we also have our AMC, which is our asset management company. And the reason why we founded the AMC in 2009 was to do exactly what you asked. How do we take um, sovereign wealth funds who were coming to us and saying, let us invest beside you in your equity positions. But again, <coughs> not really capable on a transaction by transaction basis, mm -hmm. deciding whether or not it was a good equity investment. So our asset management company manages about $10 billion, of which seven comes from 58 um, different LPs, many of whom are sovereign wealth funds, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. give them an access and opportunity to equities in emerging markets that they otherwise wouldn't have had. So again, you can create vehicles. I believe the capital's there. What's maybe not there are the projects um, in some of the more difficult markets mm -hmm. to be investing in. Right. Clear. Um, the, 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 the third question, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't take it yet, which is basically about integrating simply the well-being, uh, as I understood it, the well-being of the people, which <coughs> is what is what is called mental health, mm. into these mega projects, mm. does it resonate with you? Yeah. It it does. I, I think uh, one cautious comment I would make is, you know, and especially if you want to do SDG properly, there are those direct <coughs> impacts that you can have, and there are indirect impacts that take a long time to measure. And as we say, the, you know, the best is often the enemy of the good. So when you try to focus on 10 different indirect impact, you can get lost. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think uh, for having financed and developed quite a number of social infrastructure, 
There's only no country today where, as part of the initial thinking of the design and other things, that this particular aspect of mental well-being of the people uh, is taken into account. I think a lot of architectural firms and things have grown huge practices around this topic, and perhaps it can be done uh, even more. But I think it's also very difficult to, to sort of spread it around when, you, when you're building a new thing, you're creating something in the environment, it's almost automatic now that people should do so. Uh, when you're dealing with other type of SDG, it's a little more complicated. If, for example, you're creating clean energy, and I don't know, solar power plants or, or dam to integrate that aspect. So I, I think it's also a question of being pragmatic and also focused if you want to achieve impact because especially in direct impact, this is a very tough SDG to, uh, yeah. to sort of cope with uh, because there's health and there's mental health, there's yeah. about everything in there. So health is easier than mental health. <laughs> That's why we sort of all have crazy, but don't, don't accept that we are, but... Uh, <laughs> So, so that, that's sort of my caution, but, but I think it's, it's a really good point, and I think there's been great progress, especially when building, uh, creating new buildings and new facilities, mm -hmm. and these things have been taken into account. So can I touch on human yes. capital, because it is really important. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, we did, the World Bank Group did a flagship, and we looked at, we called it the wealth of nations, and in the developed world, two-thirds of a nation's wealth comes from its people and the development of its people, their health and their education. Um, and taking a step back from that, we then said, are we as an institution looking hard enough at the longer term development from a health perspective, from a stunting perspective in early childhood, from an education perspective? And what we realized was probably not. We had spent a lot of our focus on infrastructure. And again, we have governments in emerging markets who are very interested in infrastructure because they need to get reelected, right? And that mm -hmm. bridge, that airport, that road helps them get reelected. Mm -hmm. So we created and launched last year something called the Human Capital Index, which was an incredibly um, bold and audacious mm -hmm. thing for us to do. But in essence, what we did is went in, not all countries have done it. There's 130 countries that now are ranked Mm -hmm. country by country against a human capital index that says, what are the outcomes you get from your education? Not the number of years in school, but the outcomes that you actually achieve. Um, how healthy are your citizens? And what does that imply long term? Because again, if we go back to this notion of digital infrastructure, mm -hmm. digitization, digital economies, if you do not have healthy, well-educated citizens, your ability to continue to create jobs in the medium to long term is going to go away. So human capital matters, and thinking about um, human capital, health, and education are as important as, as critical infrastructure at this point. Mm. Great. With these uh, beautiful words, I will, uh, I will invite you to, to give a, a word of conclusion, maybe a last, uh, a last mm -hmm. word. Mary? I think I'd just like to address that question, if you don't mind, in my closing, because it reminded me of um, the importance of digital infrastructure when it comes to health. So there's an interesting Jordanian startup called Tibbi, which is a telehealth, also net-based um, health platform that has provided medical advice to people who don't have uh, coverage. And they've expanded also to, to Egypt, and they outsource mm. a lot to, to Gaza. Uh, so I just think that's an interesting model of how digital infrastructure can support health. And of course, health is the cornerstone of, of everything. And as 17 Asset Management, we've been sort of mapping sector by sector to see where the challenges are and therefore where the opportunities could be. And health for us uh, is number one. And we've been engaging with the healthcare sector, including the mental health care sector in Jordan, to see what opportunities there could be. And certainly there are opportunities when it comes to healthcare for women and children. As a mother of three, I see that you know other mothers who don't come from the privileged position that I do, they don't have access to decent healthcare for their children. Um, so there's definitely uh, room for growth there. In addition, it's tied to um, Jordan's strategy when it comes to growth. So healthcare tourism, wellness tourism um, is a big, uh, big issue in Jordan at the moment. So I definitely think that there's a lot that can be done on healthcare. Great. We are just on time. So uh, I want just to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.